Good morning. Welcome to worship this Sunday, November 14th. My name is Pastor Laura. I am the pastor here at Mount Zion United Methodist and Scottsville United Methodist. It is wonderful to be able to worship with you this Sunday. I invite you to take a moment, light a candle signifying how our Lord is here in our midst as we worship. Let's join together in our opening prayer. Oh God, you have planted seeds of discipleship in our hearts. During this time of worship, water and grow those seeds and lighten our hearts and minds so that we can delight in you and follow your teachings in all that we do. We pray in the name of our teacher and king, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. For announcements, I just want to remind you what I talked about last week with the season of Advent coming up. We are going to be having an Advent study here at Scottsville United Methodist using Light of the World. We have already placed our order for the books, but if you would like to get the book on your own so you can follow along, if you would like copies of the handouts that I'll be giving out, put a note in the comments, send an email to me, and I'll be sure to get you that information. We also have available Advent devotionals by the Society of St. Andrew. These are always meaningful devotions, and so I invite you again to leave a note in the comments, to shoot us an email so that we can make sure you can get a, either paper or an electronic version of that. And finally, check out our website because we have some wonderful Christmas cards for sale by some of the inmates in our Hope Beyond the Bars prison ministry. And so if you want to get your Christmas cards, I invite you to check that out. We also have 2022 calendars available with artwork done by the inmates. Let's now join in listening to our first scripture reading. November 14th. I'll be reading from Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we are going back to the book of James to finish our sermon series on this important book of Christian discipleship. Let's do a quick review of what we've learned not to do and what to do as we seek to plant and water the seeds of God's love and discipleship in ourselves and in others. We've learned that our faith calls us to be active doers and not simply hearers. But as we strive to do and to live faithfully, we have to be careful to resist the lure of wealth and the temptation to favor the wealthy or to make money at the detriment of others. We also have to be careful about the words we speak and to even resist speaking if we can't say something kind. If you are anything like me, then you have been challenged by this book and by these lessons. The book of James reminds us how difficult it can be to live the life of a disciple. How we have a high standard that we have to live up to. How hard it can be to work at being a true disciple of God. And this week's reading from James is no different. Our final look at the life of discipleship according to the book of James continues to call us to this high standard. This is a reading from James chapter 4. Listen for the word of God. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. You 
covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask, or you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So then, are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. There is a lot in this chapter from James, and we won't be able to cover everything today, but I wanted to read the entire chapter because I think it all fits together. James starts out by asking us, who are we friends with? The world or God? Where does our loyalty lie? With the world or with God? James tells us how the root of our conflicts is friendship with the world. The root of our dissatisfaction with our possessions, the root of our jealousies and desiring after the goods of others is our friendship with the world. Now, I do want to note that there is a lot of good in the world. After all, God created the world and named all of creation as very good. God also created us humans with the ability to create and to use our brains and imaginations. And there is so much in the world that we have created that is good. So what does James mean when he talks about friendship with the world? I believe he is referring to that in the world or larger culture or society that draws us away from God. While there is a lot of good and beauty in the world, there also is a lot that can draw us away from God, such as advertising appeals to our ego that try to get us to be dissatisfied with what we have or who we are so that we will spend and consume more. Anything that tries to get us to focus only on ourselves or to focus on gaining power or wealth or that tries to make us see enemies lurking everywhere or that tries to feed on and exploit our fears or that causes us to see other people as less than humans or not worthy of respect. This is what draws us away from God. These are the things of the world that James is warning against and that cause us to be adulterers. Because when we choose friendship with the world over friendship with God, when we prioritize the world over what 
God wants us to do, when we ignore how God is calling us to live in order to focus on how the world wants us to live, then we betray God. We are like adulterers. As Christians, as followers of God, we have promised God that we would be faithful disciples, that we will live for God. And so when we choose the world over God, then we break that promise and we are adulterers to God. As this passage continues, we get more advice on how to live as disciples of God, how to live according to friendship with God instead of friendship of, with the world. And a lot of what James is saying echoes the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount that's found in Matthew's Gospel. James gives us a good summary of a lot of what Jesus says in that most famous sermon because this is what is required of us as disciples. Pure and humble hearts, recognizing our sin and repenting, recognizing our dependence upon God, not judging our neighbors and not being prideful. We also are reminded that in the scheme of creation, our lives are short. We remembered last week with All Saints Sunday how short our lives really can be. We can make plans, and as a planner myself, I have to say that plans can be very good to have. But we also need to know that plans may change, that we may never get to do what we hoped for or planned for. So the most important thing for us to do is to live the way the Lord wishes us to live. To live as faithful disciples each and every day. Then we get to that final challenge from James. And this is a challenge for us. That if we know what is right and fail to do it, then we commit sin. For me, this is the most convicting verse in all of James. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. Jesus has told us the right things to do. James has reinforced these lessons. We can no longer feign ignorance. We can no longer pretend not to know what to do or what not to do. Instead, we are held responsible for what we do and for what we don't do. But there is hope. There is hope for us to respond well to this challenge, to live this kind of life of discipleship, because others have. Today we're going to take a closer look at someone who did live this life of discipleship, this life of choosing friendship with God over friendship with the world. And that person's name is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was born on August 26, 1910, an ethnic Albanian living in what was then the Ottoman Empire. By 12 years old, she knew that she would commit herself to the Lord. She knew that God was calling her to orders as a nun. She left home at 18 to join the Sisters of Loreto, and in 1929, she arrived in India. But it wasn't until September 10, 1946, that she really heard God calling her to a life of faithful discipleship. On that day, she was on a train to the Loreto Convent in Darjeeling in India, traveling from Calcutta, and Mother Teresa says she felt God's call. Quote, I was to leave the convent and help the poor while living among them. It was an order. To fail would have been to break the faith. End quote. To fail would have been to break the faith. To fail to ignore this call would have been to betray God. To choose friendship with the world over friendship with God. Mother Teresa chose to honor God's call in her life. She chose to respond faithfully, and her life and work impacted millions. The group she founded, the Missionaries of Charity, began as a small group of 13 members 
1950. And by her death in 1997, it had grown to 4,000 sisters running orphanages, AIDS hospices, the end charity centers all over the world, and caring for refugees, the aged, the addicted, disabled, the poor, the homeless, and victims of floods, epidemics, and famine. She opened hospices for people who were dying who had nowhere else to go, and she opened homes for those suffering from leprosy. Mother Teresa's friendship with God changed the lives of millions. She once said, quote, by blood, I am Albanian, by citizenship, an Indian, by faith, I am a Catholic nun. As to my calling, I belong to the world. As to my heart, I belong entirely to the heart of Jesus, end quote. She was called to work in the world, to, but to be friends with, to belong to the heart of God. You might say, well, that's Mother Teresa. There's no way we can live up to her example. She's a giant in the faith, so why should we even try? Well, I give us this example of Mother Teresa not to discourage us, but to give us hope. She didn't start out trying to be anything other than faithful to God, to live with her heart belonging entirely to God. And this is what James is calling us to do. We can see how this type of devotion and faith spurred Mother Teresa to be a doer of the faith and to resist the lure of wealth. And the important thing to note is that she did not do all of this work alone. She started out with 12 others and by her death, she had 3,999 others working with her. That work continues on to this day. We don't know the names or stories of the other sisters, but we do know that they are doers of the faith. We know that they are faithful to God and choose God over the lure of the world. We know that they know what the right thing to do is and that they are striving to do it. They too are an example for us. James is pushing us to examine ourselves and our faith and to ask ourselves difficult and important questions. How are we being doers of God's word and not just hearers? How are we living out our friendship with God? How are we choosing God over the world? Are we doing those things we know are right? Or do we sin by our inaction? To whom are we faithful? To whom do our hearts belong? These aren't rhetorical questions. These are questions that need an answer. We need to be honest with ourselves and with God. We need to answer these questions in our own lives and in the life of our congregation. How are we being doers of God's word and not just hearers? How are we living out our friendship with God? How are we choosing God over the world? Are we doing those things we know are right? Or do we sin by our inaction? To whom are we faithful? To whom do we belong? We are called to faithfulness, to active discipleship that makes disciples and plants love. To do this doesn't mean that we have to wait for a burning bush moment where God proclaims a grand path for us to follow. Rather, seeking to be faithful to God means taking small steps of discipleship in our lives. It means doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. It means proclaiming release to the captives, visiting the sick and imprisoned, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the widows and the orphans, spreading the news of God's love. It means looking at the world around us and seeing where God's presence is needed and then being that presence. It means spending time with God in study and prayer so that we can have the strength to go out and act 
and do the right things we see around us. When we come to church, when we worship online, we are proclaiming that we want to be faithful disciples. So let's let God in the book of James challenge us and even change us. In our discipleship, let's be faithful to God and let us be active, planting love, doing good, and doing the right things that we know we need to do. And let's give thanks that friendship with God is a two-way street. And as God's friend, God fills us with grace, courage, love, and strength to do this work. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join together now in a time of prayer. And as we hold before the Lord our joys and our concerns, we also want to remember that this past Thursday we honored veterans. It was Veterans Day, so we want to take a moment in our prayer time to remember our veterans. Let us pray. Holy Lord, thank you for how you are present in our midst. Thank you for your light that continues to shine in our lives and that strengthens us for the work of discipleship that helps, helps us to know what the right thing to do is. And thank you for those times this past week when we got it right, when we really were your faithful disciples. Continue to be our guide in all that we do. And Lord, we also hold before you all of the concerns that we carry on our hearts and minds, and we remember and pray for those who are sick and injured, for those who are still under a doctor's care, who are in therapy or at a rehab center, for those who are getting ready to begin treatment. We pray for healing, for strength, for peace, Comfort those who mourn. Send your spirit of hope upon them. And Lord, we also pause and remember that this week we honored and gave thanks for our veterans. And we once more turn to you and give thanks for our veterans. Thank you for those who have been willing to serve. We pray especially for those who are currently in the military and currently serving overseas, and we pray for their safety. We pray for the physical and mental health of all of our veterans, and we pray for their families. Again, Lord, thank you. And God, in this time of prayer, we also remember all of those places of concern and those places of joy that we have experienced or read about this past week. And so now we take a moment to pause and hold those before you. And we also pause to listen for your voice speaking into our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our gifts to the Lord. Thank you for the gifts that you have mailed in with your offerings. And thank you for all of the ways that you are willing to serve and offer yourself, your time, talents, gifts, and service to the work of the church and to our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for these offerings. Bless them and bless us so that we can use them to continue that work of making disciples so that we can continue that work of being disciples. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's join together now in singing our doxology. Let's sing together our closing hymn, Jesus Calls Us. Receive the benediction. Let us go forth this week proclaiming that we are friends of God, that we choose God. And let us go forth to make disciples, to walk the path of discipleship that the book of James calls us to. And we go forth knowing that God will strengthen us in this work. And so we go in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.